Okay, so my thoughts on the Rugby World Cup so far. Now, before I delve into my view and my thoughts on things, obviously we haven't seen every nation kick off their campaign yet. Uruguay, Portugal, Samar and Tonga will be kicking off their campaigns in this round of fixtures from Thursday through till Sunday. So we will see every nation play by the end of the second week. So we can't discuss uh, the scheduling and is it a fair and balanced schedule for every nation for turnaround between games. Can't really comment on that because obviously we haven't had a full sweep of everyone playing at least once. Some teams will be having a weekend off this weekend. Obviously other teams obviously start their tournament. So I can't comment on the scheduling just yet uh, until we've seen every team play at least two to three pool matches and then we can work out is the scheduling fair. That has been criticised in the past. Now, positive notes. Style of play, we're seeing more running rugby. We'll change, that kind of rule change to encourage speed of play and speed up the game and add fatigue. Loving it. So more teams are willing to actually take risk in their 22. That is fun to watch as a neutral. If, of course, if you're supporting your team and want a team to win, like Fiji against Wales, for example, uh, then you're sort of like that. But Because um, I was banking for Fiji in that game, because I like an upset. I think it adds to the tournament. So I was biting a few nails in the Fiji-Wales game. The fact it went down to the final pass in the final minute of the game, in the final phase of play, that's what you want. Um, I don't think World Rugby planned it to go that way between Wales and Fiji, but that's what we want. We want to see teams taking risks, chance in their arms. Mistakes are make games fun. When it's very conservative and controlled and it's just a grind and, and you can sort of predict that neither side is going to chance their arm in, in awkward positions, it becomes a bit dull and predictable. The unpredictability is fun. Love it. Crowd numbers, fantastic. I do understand, obviously, the, using less stadiums this time around because, of A, cost, you want to keep costs down, maximise profit. I understand that. Probably the reasons why France withdrew from hosting the Rugby League World Cup in a couple of years' time is that cost side of things. They've got the Olympics coming up next year as well. And I think a few world championships and other major sporting events. So France are very mindful, the organisers are very, very mindful of operating costs over making money. They want to make more of that and spend less of that, I understand. And there are some criticisms of some of the cost-saving measures they've used. Obviously... Not all the stadiums are rugby specific. Some are multi-use and some are actually predominantly football stadiums. So the Stade Velodrome and, in, and the stadium in St Etienne, they are used by football clubs and that is normally their primary use. The Stade Velodrome does have smaller pitch dimensions, smaller in goals and the turf is taking a battering. And when I say that, whole sections of it roll up with, with scrums, rucks, mauls in, in the tackle area. Now it's easily stamped back down again, but that could lead to a nasty ankle or knee or leg injury. And that is what we want to avoid. And the stadium surfaces in previous international sporting tournaments have been criticised in France, especially women's and men's Euros and World Cups. In recent years, the playing surfaces were criticised. Now, obviously, well, football World Cups take place in June, July and August, um, whereas rugby World Cups take place in September, October, November. So slightly later in the year, it's been a very hot summer, very dry, major, especially in southern France. So pitch maintenance. But look, Apart from a few ticketing issues, I think, at the, the England-Argentina game where fans had issues entering. For the most part, those little gremlins happen at every major tournament. Can't complain. Crowd numbers have been fantastic. The atmosphere has been fantastic. Can't complain. Um, now, the criticisms. All the rule changes World Rugby continue to do, or law changes, so I say, every bloody off every year, it's starting to become problematic. The rules back between 2003 and 2007, I think, were perfect. I think that was when Rugby Union... Early on in the professional era, 20 odd years ago to 15 odd years ago, was at its best. The game was played perfectly, I wouldn't say perfectly, but played, I think, at a, a good, everyone can see it was at a better consistency. Um, and we didn't have a lot of the issues we're now facing with constant rule changes. Now, I understand player welfare is a priority, but I think World Rugby being very reactionary, which is then leading to difference of uh, interpretation of the new laws and therefore inconsistency of refereeing and also we've now seen the upgrade downgrade rule of yellow, yellows and reds that Sinbin period and the inconsistencies there now the, the incident that I two instances that I've discussed in match reviews is Tom Curry his yellow being upgraded to a red against Argentina and Sigrin for Chile uh, against Japan staying as a yellow carbon copy instance consistency please um so and again accidental head contact i think we need to referee with common sense but now the new law state it's it's minimum yellow i think that's ridiculous because if you if you're gonna do that then you might as well look at every single head contact in the game 
which means we're not allowed to ruck more or have scrums anymore, and then we wouldn't end up with no players left on the frigging pitch after about five minutes. So common sense needs to apply. Well, rugby needs to apply common sense as well when coming up with new rules because we're seeing confused consequences. Now the standard of officiating. Some games it's been fantastic. Other games, shocking. I think, look, I, we can discuss Fiji Wales now that we've had a bit more time to digest that result. Um, I think Fiji are, are, could, could feel hard done by, by a poor refereeing performance. They had everything on the field, especially that last 10, 15 minutes. It was, well, we're going to throw the kitchen sink and half the Fiji at this. Um, Wales got some favourable calls. I think Wales could have ended up with a, at least one more sin bin and potentially two penalty tries against them. I felt sorry for Fiji having their player in the sin bin. Yeah, and I actually think that rolling ball had split and there was a truck and trailer, so we can discuss whether Wales should have actually been a player up at that point. But that's another thing. But there was an instant, no arms tackle, that should have been a penalty try at least, and repeat infringements on their try line in two separate spells of play. The, the sim binning's in the middle of the field, but in the two separate phases, when the two periods when Wales are on the back foot in the middle of the second half, where they basically win the game by not conceding points, and at the end, when they're starting to ship points, I think there should have been at least two more sim bins in there. The sim bin that happens in the middle of the field um, resets the warning, apparently, for repeat infringements in the last 10-12 minutes, which then denies Fiji, I think, the chance of, of, of winning the game. However, Rodrigo does drop the ball in that final pass. So that game... Refereeing was poor. I think Wales got away with a lot more than they should have, and Fiji, I think, were harshly done by with their yellow. But that's blown up in the comments section on the, on the match review. The South Africa Scotland game, no yellows. It's the only game with no sin bins so far. I will discuss the amount of sin bins. I think we, we are too card happy. Two major calls. One was a no call. They missed the Jesse Creel. Now, the referees, I felt in that game, had a good game. I think they had a good game. Uh, the on field ref was brilliant. Uh, the two Lionos were brilliant. In that game, the TMO let them down. Finn Russell should have been Simbind, and Jesse Creel should have been Simbind. Now, the Jesse Creel one is it wasn't even picked up at all. Finn Russell, the referee knows there's been potentially an illegal tackle, but he's relying on his TMO to help him. And the TMO basically goes, ah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not a Simbind. It's just a yellow. He shoulder charges a player. Now, regardless of force, that is an act of foul play. That is no attempt to make a legal tackle on that, would, I would assume be an attempt to injure. If you were going to go, ah, this player is expecting me to wrap, I'm going to put my shoulder through him, and I'm not going to wrap, and I'm going to do it at pace, when he's going at pace, that for me is an intent to injure. I've played the game, I know what a shoulder charge is, it hurts, especially if you're bracing to be wrapped, or you're expecting to have a wrapping tackle, admittedly low force, a, sh a shoulder, when, when you're not expecting it, will hurt. It can lead to whiplash effect, uh, impact on your neck, which then can lead to a concussion, even with low force. And that will break some ribs. If, if aimed in the right place, you, you can have a punctured lung. So when people say the game's going soft, da, 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 a shoulder charge is a fucking shoulder charge. He gets away with one. Jesse Creel should have been, if we're going by the precedent that's been set with accidental head contact or deliberate head contact in a tackle situation, he should have gone as well. The TMO's missed that completely. Now, I've reviewed and watched that footage, and I'm thinking, how the, how can a TMO miss that? What is interesting is the TMO in his little bunker box is not actually at each individual game. He's up in Paris. You could be in Marseille. You could be in St Etienne. You could be in Bordeaux or Toulouse or Nantes, which is going to host some games. Nowhere near Paris. What was if the feed goes down? Why is the TMO not at the same stadium as the referee? Unless you're in the Stade de France. Why? Can someone explain that to me? I think that's another cost-saving measure by the organisers of World Rugby, so they maximise profits. And that is another concern, is they're cutting... There's the chat, the anthem singing, I, I agree. Yes, use the youth choir. They're singing in, in isolation. It's beautiful, it's fantastic. Have a backing band and maybe have a soprano opera singer or a national anthem singer, which they are complementing, because it's been a bit shambolic with the timing. Again, cost-saving measure to maximise revenue. They're, they're putting profits over getting the product right on and off the field in certain aspects. Just saying. Um, now, the ball. Have Gilbert altered the, the actual physical characteristics of the ball? I like the colour scheme they've got for it, fantastic, but this ball seems to be bouncing on its points slightly differently and bouncing off its sides slightly differently than a normal Gilbert Six Nations or Rugby Championship ball. Um, 
It seems to move in the air differently when kicked and passed. Have they altered the design of that? Just a just an observation of what I've seen, or is it just the colour design of the actual World Cup ball design colour colour scheme playing tricks in my eyes? But it does seem to be bouncing slightly differently. I haven't heard any players yet complain about the ball. They've obviously had some time with all the build up games to get used to it and training camps, so they seem to be getting used to it pretty quickly. We've seen other ball manufacturers that make rugby balls like Mighty and Web Ellis, for example, especially uh, the Mighty balls, which I actually prefer playing with, by the way, when I played. I used to have a couple. Um, they're much nicer to kick. I, I actually prefer rugby league balls, to be to be fair, for, for, especially as, as someone who kicks a lot. When I used to be an outside back, I used to put my foot through it. They kick better than a Gilbert, just just because they're slightly different design, different shape. Um, but you know, we've seen uh, we've seen Adidas make rugby union balls. Uh, I think Nike have made some. Obviously, World Rugby have gone with Gilbert, and that's fine. That's their ball supplier for the tournament. Have they altered the, the actual physical characteristics? I think they might have, but I haven't heard any players complain. But it does seem to be bouncing and 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 moving in the air when it's kicked and passed, and when it bounces off the ground, it seems to behave differently to previous Gilbert balls. Have Gilbert decided to completely change their design going forward, or is this just a design for the World Cup? Um, also, finally, and I think this again is a corporate move rather than, a, than an actual aesthetics move. Why are teams, when there's no jersey clash, being forced to away, wear their away jersey? I don't like it. France, as host as the home team, wearing their away kit against the All Blacks. Why can't France wear the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Les Bleus, uh, Azure Blue that they, they wear, and the All Blacks wear black? Their black kit. Why are they wearing their white away? I don't get that. That is clearly. Look, we have two kits for sale other than one. That's a corporate move. That's clearly the manufacturer saying we've got two kits for sale here. Can we get as much game time for both equally so we can flog more merchandise? Same with South Africa wearing their interesting away kit. Not, I'm not overly keen on it. I probably will buy one in time as a collector's item. But there's no jersey clash with Scotland. South Africa wear a gold collar, gold band on the arm, green top. It's a spring box top. Dot. It, it's 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 South African green. I mean, where's and Scotland wear dark navy blue. So where's the jersey clash? And Romania, Ireland, Ireland wear a light green. We know the emerald green of Ireland. Romania have yellow, blue and red as their yellow on the top, blue shorts, red socks. National flag, national colours of Romania. Why are they wearing their Fijian looking um, away kit, which is white with black bag? Now, admittedly, they did have some Romanian traditional um, striping on the sleeves, which I thought was a very neat, beautiful touch by the kit designer. Why, though, are they wearing their white away when, again, there is no jersey clash? That has got to be corporate at the jersey manufacturers and World Rugby going, and the unions going, oh, money. We make money by selling merchandise. That is a corporate decision that's putting profits over the actual product. It, I, wear, let, the, let the nations wear their traditional colours. That's the whole point of expressing yourself and showing off to the world. That is a little bugbear of mine. I, I don't mind some of these secondary kits because, yeah, occasionally you do have to wear them and they are really nice. That is a corporate. That's a corporate decision by the unions, the, the rugby world, world rugby organisers and the kit manufacturers to make more money. Um, so I'm not overly keen on that uh, as a bit of a bit of a little bit of a tradition. But it's just like there's no kit clash. Let the nations wear the traditionals. But why? Uh, why is a home the, the, the scheduled home team in this case France, France, New Zealand wearing their away? Why? Why is South Africa again the scheduled home team wearing their away when there's not even a kit clash? I do not understand this. I've never understood this. This has got to be a corporate decision. Apparently, money trumps everything. No, it doesn't. Sometimes keep a bit of tradition there, please. Keep that little bit of history there, please. And the remaining kit's fantastic. Their normal kit is absolutely fantastic. It's brightly coloured. It's it's traditional national colours. It's the national flag. Why are they not wearing that in their their opening group stage? Anyway, that's that's my little ramble on my thoughts of how the tournament's gone so far. Um, my main concern, my main concern though, is the referee consistency and how these rule changes are confusing things. Um, there's too many rule changes too quickly. Uh, well, rugby um, seem to want to change rules almost on a monthly basis. It seems 
Um, and that is leading to confusion for the officials, confusion for the fans and players making a totally legal tackle a year ago. Now that's 10 to a red. Uh, accidental head contact has been harshly punished. I, I, but again, I understand that the head contact is player welfare and, and stopping foul play. But accidental head clashes are going to happen. We are going down a slippery slope where results are going to be impacted because a referee deems it a yellow, gets upgraded to a red, and it's a completely accidental clash of heads. And in both cases, if the player actually ducks down even further to make a, a lower tackle, the attacking player could get sent for leading with a, a, a forearm, an elbow, or a shoulder when he's just bracing for impact. We saw that in the Six Nations. We saw it in the Six Nations. So, again, an accidental, well, the tackler's gone low, or gone lower than, than shoulder height, so he's going lower. He's aiming, obviously, to make a legal tackle. But the, the tackled player, the player in possession, bracing for contact, puts a shoulder or an elbow or a forearm, protect the ball, protects himself and brace, knocks the tackler out. He then gets sent and gets a, an upgrade. I, this is where rugby incidents happen. Occasionally, players will get concussed in tackle. Occasionally, a ruck or a maul, there's going to be an accidental head clash. Common sense seems to have left the room by reactionary rule changes, which create more problems than solutions, because world rugby is terrified of being sued to shit. The problem is, in previous generations, they didn't seem to pay as much attention to post-playing welfare when players have to retire because of injury, when they do retire, looking after them. That's what's key, is when they do get injured, make sure they actually fully recover from that injury. If they are concussed, give them a lengthier stand-down period. Maybe they don't. Have, maybe if they get concussed in game one, they don't play the rest of the tournament. Actually look after the players when they're hurt then, rather than expecting them to, oh, he's met the protocols. Has anyone heard of delayed concussion syndrome? You could pass an HIA on the field. Later that night, you, you develop concussion symptoms and you're seriously ill, and then you're in hospital. Maybe look at the HIA protocols going, that guy should sit out the rest of the game. Even though he's passed on the field HIA assessment or in the stands, and he could, in theory, as the rules currently stand, go back and play. Maybe let's assess him over the next couple of days, and then if he doesn't show any symptoms, OK, then we can ease him back in and, and he may play the next game. Delayed concussions are a thing. It seems like World Rugby think, oh, in 10 minutes, he's, if he doesn't show any signs, he's fine. They're not. I personally think that the current concussion protocols are too weak. Even if a player, player passes within that 10 minutes or 15 minutes or however long it is, that concussion symptoms come in 8, 10, 12 hours the next day later. And then suddenly we have an issue where he gets doubly concussed in a game. And that can kill you. So I think they've, got, they've muddled it around head contact. It's making, and I think we are being too card happy. Too many cards have been shown so far. One game has not had any cards. The one that I was expecting the most cards in. South Africa, Scotland. We have seen too many yellow cards, um, and then we've seen inconsistencies on how yellows are awarded. Yes, we want to see the game sped up, but at what expense? Like, the, mm, too many rule changes. But anyway, that's my view on things as things stand so far. Place your thoughts on how things, how you think the opening weekend went, and I'll have some more content for you very, very soon.